did one. Uh, derivatives of inverse trig functions. These uh, when it comes to the AP exam, you probably need to memorize the last two here. Probably not on the exam. At least they have not been on the exam in the recent past. Okay, but derivatives of inverse trig functions is one of those things where you may see a question or two that addresses this. Okay, uh, you do probably need to memorize the, the first four there. They're not too hard. Notice uh, the cosine, the cotangent, and the cosecant, all the ones that begin with C, have a negative. And the formula is, for example, if I have the inverse sine of something, I'm going to take the derivative of whatever that is in the numerator, and then in the denominator, I have 1 minus whatever that is squared. So I'm going to work a couple of examples of these today, and then we're going to look at some other inverses. And then at the end of class, we're going to play a little game. So I'm excited about that. It's pretty fun, the first three periods. So here we go. One for who? One for everybody. Okay. Here we go. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this as the inverse sine of x squared. Uh, arc sine and inverse sine here, these both mean the same thing. And so I need to take the derivative. And so following my formula, I'm going to take the derivative of u. And u is whatever is inside the parentheses here. So in the numerator, derivative of x squared is 2x. And then in the denominator, I'm going to have the square root of 1 minus whatever this is squared. So I should have x squared squared. And I'm going to leave it like that. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and the second one here, I'm going to rewrite it as five inverse tangents, and then I've got an x plus one to the one half. And so technically, I'm going to do the product rule here. When I'm finding the derivative, I'm going to take my first term, which is five, and multiply it by the derivative of the inverse tangent. Uh, the second half of the product rule <coughs> is just going to be zero. So now I need to take the derivative of the inverse tangent of x plus one raised to the one half. So I'm going to take the derivative of this part right here, the x plus one raised to the one half. And so I'm going to do the chain rule. One half comes out front. The x plus 1 comes down. I subtract 1 from the exponent. I multiply by the derivative of what's inside there, which in this case is just 1. And so it doesn't change it. And then in the denominator here, I'm going to have 1 plus u squared. And u is going to be the square root of x plus 1. So I'm going to have square root of x plus 1 squared. What happened to the one half? Yeah, the one just cancel out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it unsimplified, but yes, you are correct. I could simplify this. So that would cancel, and I would have 1 plus x plus 1, so x plus 2 in my denominator, but I'm just going to leave it. Uh, and then this 5 is multiplied by all of that, but I'm going to leave it unsimplified.
How much does one have? This? Yes. Are you asking where that came from? This isn't it. X plus one to the one half. Uh, I just I rewrote it as the square root oh, of x plus one. Okay, yes. there. Mm -hmm. All right. Any any other questions on that one? Nah. Okay. On this one, same thing. I am going to rewrite it. This is going to be two x inverse cosine, and I'm going to write this as x to the negative one. And then I'm going to do the product rule. So my first term is the 2x. So I have 2x times the derivative of the next term. And my next term is the inverse cosine of x to the negative 1. So I need to take the derivative of x to the negative 1, which is negative x to the negative 2. However, cosine, look at your little formula there. Cosine is negative. So I'm going to have a negative, negative x to the negative 2. So I've got this times positive x. Let me rewrite that. Well, positive x to the negative 2 in my numerator. And then in my denominator, I'm going to have the square root of 1 minus 1 over x squared. OK, and so at this point, I have 2x times the derivative of the inverse cosine. And this is my derivative of the inverse cosine. But now I need to do the second half of the product rule. It's not 0 like it was in example number 2. So I have plus. My second term is inverse cosine of 1 over x. And then I'm going to multiply it by the derivative of 2x, which is just 2. And I'm going to leave it like that, unsimplified. Is there also in the numerator? No, 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 no. Sorry, I ran out of room there. But this 2x is multiplied by all of this term. And then I have plus inverse cosine of 1 over x times 2, but it's not in the numerator. It's a it's a completely separate term. Oh, so like the 5 and 2x are not part of the fraction? They're just multiplying on the outside? Right. Yes, that is correct. Anything else? All right, well, let's look at example 2 here. It says a particle moves along the x-axis so that its position in meters at any time for t greater than or equal to zero is given by the position function where the inverse cotangent of t squared plus one. Find the velocity at t is equal to two. So I need v of t. And in order to get v of t from the position function, I'm going to take the derivative. And so I need my derivative of the inverse cotangent. And you'll notice, look at the formula there. The derivative has a negative. And then I need to find the derivative of what's inside the parentheses there for my u prime. So derivative of t squared plus 1 is 2t. And then in the denominator, I have 1 plus u squared. So I'm going to have t squared plus 1 squared. So why is it negative? Why is it negative? Yeah, why is it negative? Because if you will look up here at your formula, the derivative of the inverse cotangent has a negative out front there. And they want me to evaluate it at t is equal to 2. So I need to find v of 2. So I'm going to take 2 and plug it in for t into my equation. So when I plug in t, I've got negative 2 times 2. And then in the denominator, I've got 1 plus, And that's going to give me 2 squared plus 1. So I've got 1 plus 5 squared which is going to give me negative 4 over 26, 25 plus 1. 
And this is going to be in meters. Position is in meters. Time is in seconds. So I could reduce the fraction here to negative 2 over 13 meters per second. All right, take a look at the first page there. Any questions, anything else that you would like me to go over there before we get to our last example for inverse trig functions? All right, well, turn the page. Example three says, write the equation of the tangent line to y is equal to the inverse sine of x when x is equal to the square root of 3 over 2 without a calculator. So we head on into the calculus jungle. We need two things to write the equation of a line. What is the first thing? mx plus b. Let me see if I can interpret what you're saying. You are saying the first thing we need to do is find the slope. All right, well, we find the slope by taking the derivative of our equation, and our equation is the inverse sine of x. So y prime is going to be the derivative of u, and u in this case is just x, so u prime would be 1. Over, I've got the square root of 1 minus, and then following the formula, it's u squared. So I'm going to have an x squared in my denominator. Okay, so what is x? Uh, the square root of three over two. So I'm gonna take that and plug it in. So that's going to give me one over, um, one over the square root of one minus, the square root of 3 over 2 squared. And let's see. That's going to give me uh, the square root of 3 squared. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is just 3. It's radical 9, right? So 3. And then 2 squared is 4. So that's going to give me 1 minus 3 fourths. 1 minus 3 fourths is 1 fourth. So I've got 1 over the square root of 1 fourth. Square root of 1 fourth is 1 fourth. I got it. Um, 1 eighth. No, 116. I agree with that. Well, we are on a fraction roll this morning. <laughs> it's what? It's half. One half. Oh, yeah, it's half. One half times one half is no. one fourth. No. Therefore, no. the square root of one fourth is one half. So I've got one divided by one half. So my slope is two. See, I was tripped up because it was gonna get, it get bigger and it should have got smaller. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Okay, well, the second thing, first thing I need is the slope. Second thing I need is a point. Wait, and oh. I have an x value. So I need a y value. Yeah. Well, I have an equation for y. So I'm going to take my x value and plug it in to my equation to get my y value. So y equals the inverse sine of square root of three over two. So sometimes this confuses students, but it really shouldn't. It, it's really not too bad. With the caveat, you've got to know your trig functions in the first quadrant, right? And of course you do, because I mean, you learn them in pre-cal and then I've been telling you all year that, that you need to know them, right? So this is saying, what radian value of sine gives you the square root of 3 over 2? What about the negative 1, though? What radian value? This is saying inverse sine. So look, we're working backwards. Isn't it like pi over 3? It's, it's pi over 3. Okay, it's pi over 3. Because, here's why it's pi over 3. 
What is the sine of pi over 3? It's the square root of 3 over 2. Therefore, the inverse sine of the square root of 3 over 2 is pi over 3. So here's my points. I have the square root of 3 over 2, and my y value is pi over 3. So now I'm going to write the equation of my line. And I don't want to solve for b. I'm just going to leave it in point slope form. So I've got y minus pi over 3 is equal to my slope 2 times x minus the square root of 3 over 2. And this here is the equation of my line. Wait, why did you get y minus pi over 3? Yeah, why did you change it up, man? It's point slope form. You can solve for b if you want. I don't care. But so we could have done it the whole time? No, Jacob, I'm saying right now, if you take x, y, and the slope and plug them in, then you can solve for b, or you can just put them into this point slope form and be done. I know, but like our old tests, we would solve for b, you know? But you're saying we didn't have to do that? I'm we saying did. you can write it like this. I written that like that? Well, yes, oh, wow. they're equivalent. Oh, that's stupid. How do you get x minus uh, square root 3 over 2? Because it's, this is the point slope form. Okay? It's y minus whatever the y value is. It's equal to the slope times x minus whatever the x value is. Yeah, that's why that one question on the test was kind of hard for me. I didn't know. Yeah, nobody knew it, it, it looked like that. <laughs> well, okay. I think a lot of people went to the Just in general. <laughs> I guess my answer to that, Joe, would be that you learned this in Algebra 1. <laughs> and if you are an AP Calculus, I'm not going to apologize for putting an Algebra 1 question on there. <laughs> because, I mean, you could solve for B there, and you're going to get the same answer. Okay. Well, this brings us to the next type of inverse question which is given that f of g of x is equal to x and g of x is equal to the inverse of f of x for all x and f of 2 is equal to 7 and hold on f prime of 2 is equal to 6 what is g prime of 7 well woo, that is a lot of information However, let me say this. I actually see this question a lot on the AP exam and lots of students miss it, but they're really not too bad. If you follow this pattern here. Okay. So anytime, this is the key. They tell you that G of X is equal to the inverse of F of X. Anytime you see this, I can write this down. That f of g of x is equal to x. And the reason this is true, this is the definition of an inverse. Anytime g of x and f of x are inverses of each other, then the composite function of f of g of x, it's always equal to x and vice versa. g of f of x is equal to x. Okay, so now what are we looking for? We are looking for g prime of seven. So I'm going to take the derivative of my function notation here, and we know how to do this. At least we have been exposed previously on how to do this. So I can say f prime, and then the g of x comes down, times g prime of x is equal to the derivative of x, which is one. Okay, so anytime you see this type of question, you're going to be writing this line right here. F prime of X, bring down the G of X, times G prime of X, and then it's equal to one, always. So now I am looking for G prime of seven, so I know that X is equal to seven. So I'm going to plug in seven for X. So that's going to give me F prime, G of seven, times g prime of 7 equals 1. 
And the other key to doing inverse problems, when we are doing inverse is the X and the Y's switch. Correct? We remember this from what we learned previously, the X's and the Y's switch. So now I have G prime of seven, which is what I'm looking for, but I need to find G of seven. And so I'm going to look at the information that they gave me. They tell me that F of two is equal to seven. So that means that G of seven has to be equal to two. And it has to be equal to two because they are inverses of each other and the X's and the Y's switch when we are dealing with inverses. So I'm gonna write me a little note here because, because they are inverses. Points switch. As a side note, derivatives do not, but the points do switch, the X and the Y's. And so I can rewrite this line as f prime of two times g prime of seven equals one. All I did was take two and plug it in for g of seven. And do we know what f prime of two is? It is equal to six. They gave me that information. So I'm gonna cross that out and write six. And then I'm going to solve for G prime of seven, dividing by six on both sides. So I have G prime of seven equals one six. Is that the answer? That is my answer. Yeah. Whew. Let me do another one of those. <laughs> Let f be a differentiable function such that f of three is 15, f of six is three, f prime of three is negative eight, and f prime of six is negative two. The function g is differentiable, and g of x is equal to the inverse of f of x for all x. What is the value of g prime of three? So again, they tell me that g and f are inverses of each other, so I can immediately write this down. I have f of g of x is equal to x by the definition of inverses. And I'm looking for g prime of three. So I'm going to take the derivative. So that gives me f prime g of x times g prime of x is equal to one. Now I'm gonna look over here. I'm trying to find g prime of three. So I know that x is equal to three. So I've got f prime g of three times g prime of three equals one. And g prime of three is what I'm looking for. So I need to resolve this here. So I need to find g of three. And I know that g of three is equal to six because f of six is equal to three. No, that's a distractor, okay? I'm looking at that one. Okay, if f is equal to three, if, excuse me, if f of six is equal to three, then g of three is equal to six because they are inverse of each other, switching the x and the y's. So now I can write this as f prime of six times g prime of three equals one. And I know that f prime of six is negative two. Therefore, g prime of three equals negative one half. Mm -hmm. 
which value of which y value of f is equal to three? This right here tells me okay, that f of six is equal to three. Therefore, switching the x and the y's, I know that g of three is equal to six. Just like we did on the previous one. f of two is equal to seven, therefore g of seven is equal to two. Okay. This, this one's a distractor. Yeah, I get it. All right, one more, one more. If f of x is equal to 5x squared minus 2x plus 1, and it contains the point 340, and g of x is equal to the inverse of f of x, find g prime of 40. Okay, again, whenever you see the inverses, I'm going to write down f of g of x is equal to x. And I'm taking the, trying to find the derivative of g prime. So I'm going to take the derivative. So I know that f prime of g of x times g prime of x is equal to 1. All righty. Now I know that x is equal to 40 because I'm trying to find g prime of 40. So I have f prime g of 40 times g prime of 40 equals 1. And now I need to find g of 40. And I know what it is. By this right here, I know that g of 40 equals 3. So now I have f prime, substituting in 3 for g of 40, f prime of 3 times g prime of 40 is equal to 1. And this time they do not give me the f prime value, but they do give me the equation. So if f of x is equal to 5x squared minus 2x plus 1, I know that f prime of x would be 10x minus 2. And so f prime of 3 is going to be 10 times 3 minus 2, which is 28. So I know that f prime of 3 is 28. So I'm going to replace it. So I have 28 times g prime of 40 is equal to 1. And then I divide by 28 on both sides. So g prime of 40 is equal to 1 over 28. 